Hello and welcome to another Zenots Live. Today we have Mr. Fahad. Hi guys. Uh, today we'll be doing an A2 topic of phenol and carboxylic acids. So the last time uh, we had discussed benzene, right? It was a pretty long discussion on benzene, its structure, its uh, chemical reactions, and we did a few past paper questions on that. And uh, in this episode, we'll be looking at uh, a derivative of benzene, a special derivative called phenol, right? It's basically a benzene ring with the alcohol group, the OH group bonded to it, right? And then after that, we'll look at carboxylic acids. So let's get straight into phenol. All right, so a few physical properties. Phenol is a white crystalline solid at room temperature and pressure, uh, very much unlike other organic compounds. They normally tend to be liquids or gases. Phenol is a solid. And the reason why is because of a special type of intermolecular force known as hydrogen bonding, right? So for hydrogen bonding, if you guys don't remember, uh, you need a hydrogen atom that is covalently bonded to a highly electronegative atom. It could be either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Over here, we have oxygen, right? And so this creates a very strong dipole, right? The oxygen being more electronegative has a partial negative charge. The hydrogen has a partial positive, right? So we have a permanent dipole, which is particularly strong. And so with this bonds to another electronegative atom, right? This partial positive hydrogen over here in one molecule bonds to a lone pair of electrons on a highly electronegative atom in another molecule. In this case, the oxygen in another phenol molecule. Between these two guys, you're going to have a very strong hydrogen bond. And so because of that, phenol is a solid rather than a liquid or a gas. It has a relatively high melting point uh, compared to other organic compounds. And uh, somehow, even though it has hydrogen bonding, it is actually insoluble in water, right? The reason for that is not the hydrogen bonding. It's actually the benzene ring. A benzene ring is a hydrocarbon ring. And this is actually hydrogen. Literally, that means it is scared of water. Right? It doesn't want to be anywhere near water. And so that is why phenol is not very soluble in water, okay? And it's because of the benzene ring. It's not because of the OH group present. Right, so phenol, now coming to the chemical properties, it is a weak acid. What that means is that uh, phenol over here, uh, some molecules will break down to give you hydrogen ions. And the associated anion, which is called a phenoxide ion, it has a negative charge. Basically what happens is that the OH group over here loses a hydrogen ion, right? So that's what you get over here. That's what makes this an acid. And this reversible arrow over here tells us it's a weak acid, right? Only a few molecules will dissociate to give you H plus. Uh, the rest are just gonna stay put, right? Now, if we compare acidities of phenol with water and ethanol, this is the ranking, right? Phenol is actually more acidic than these other guys, right? And ethanol somehow is even less acidic than water, which is interesting because water is neutral. So let's get into why this is the case, right? So the thing is that um, phenol, when this breaks down to give you the phenoxide ion and the hydrogen ion, the phenoxide ion looks something like this, right? The OH has lost its H, right? So you have an oxygen bonded to a benzene ring. Now, if you guys remember from the previous episode, we talked about a delocalized pi bonding ring. So we had P orbitals on each of the six carbon atoms that were overlapping in both ways with each other. This was a side-on overlap, remember? not end on, but side on. And so this forms a delocalized pi bonding ring. And the lone pairs of this oxygen, now one of these guys 
is in a p orbital and it could partially overlap with the pi bonding ring. And so as a result, this lone pair becomes partially delocalized into the benzene ring. And when that happens, the negative charge density on the oxygen becomes less, right? Because the oxygen has two lone pairs. Now, if one of them basically takes a trip down uh, benzene, right? The negative charge density on the oxygen is going to decrease. And so as a result, when this negative charge density goes down, it is going to be less attractive to these H plus ions. They're not going to want to come back together, right? The H plus would rather stay away. And so that is why the concentration of H plus will be high. And so the pH will be lower. And so it's going to be more acidic, right? So this is basically an explanation of what I just told you. So we'll just move on here. And uh, now we know that water also partially breaks down. Some water molecules give you hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, right? And so even water has some sort of acidity because water molecules also end up giving up H+, right? But this acidity is less than that of phenol right? Simply because of the fact that this position of equilibrium lies further to the left, right? So there is a lower concentration of H plus in solution. Now, if you look at ethanol over here, when ethanol partially dissociates, gives you the ethoxide ion and the H plus ion, right? Now, if we apply the same reasoning um, for phenol and ethanol, then you will notice that this oxygen over here, which is the negatively charged atom, the atom that can attract the positive hydrogen ions towards itself, we need to see whether it has a lower or higher negative charge density than in the phenoxide ion. Now, the thing is that in the phenoxide ion, the lone pair of the negative oxygen was partially overlapping with the by bonding ring, so it became partially delocalized. So the negative charge density went down. But in the case of the ethoxide, you'll notice that the oxygen atom is bonded to this guy, the ethyl group, and we know that alkyl groups are electron donating. In other words, this has a positive inductive effect on the negative oxygen atom. Right, So this bond pair between the ethyl group and the oxygen atom will be pushed towards the oxygen. And so the negative charge density goes up. And so when the negative charge density goes up, it will be able to attract H plus more towards itself. And when that happens, when these guys get back together, the position of equilibrium will shift further to the left. And so the concentration of H plus will go down. And when that happens, it's less acidic. It's going to be a higher pH, right? So that is the comparison between phenol, water, and ethanol. The main comparison is between phenol and ethanol, by the way. Water is more of a control group, if you will. And over here, we have the values, right? Remember that we use the acid dissociation constant Ka to compare the acidities of weak acids, right? So we have phenol over here, which has the highest Ka, which means higher degree of dissociation, which means more H+, which means greater acidity. And you guys should also know that when you have a higher Ka, you will have a lower pKa, right? So when the acidity is greater, the Ka is going to be greater, and the pKa is going to be lower, right? And so will be the pH. When the acidity is greater, the pH will also be lower. Right, now let's get to the reactions of phenol, right? There are two types of reaction. One that involves the OH group, the alcohol group itself, and one that involves the benzene ring. Uh, again, for the previous episode, uh, we discussed the electrophilic substitution mechanism, 
uh, involving the benzene ring. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, if you want to learn about those details, you know where to go. All right, so phenol, we have already seen as a weak acid. So it will actually react with strong bases like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. It will form a salt and water, right? For example, over here, phenol reacts with sodium hydroxide. That gives us a salt over here. Now, this is known as sodium phenoxide and you get water. Basically what happened is that this OH over here bonded with the H from phenol and this gave you water. That was the neutralization, right? And the rest of it all came back together to form the salt, all right? So now one uh, experimental proof of how phenol is more acidic than ethanol. Phenol can actually react with strong bases, you know, to give a salt and water. Ethanol is so less acidic compared to phenol that it does not even react with the strongest of bases under normal conditions. And so that just tells us that, you know, phenol is more acidic than ethanol. But when they ask you why, you will have to give all that story that I gave you. So there's no shortcut to it, unfortunately. All right. And... Uh, one reaction that phenol and ethanol both go through, being weak acids, is the reaction with sodium, right? Sodium is um, amongst the most reactive metals in the reactivity series, right? Um, if you recall your IGCSE knowledge, right? Now, when it reacts with sodium, uh, what happens is that uh, the hydrogen over here in the OH becomes hydrogen gas, right? And the sodium over here becomes part of the salt, sodium phenoxide, right? Now over here, this is actually a redox reaction, right? Now, if you guys are wondering, how is this redox? Well, the thing is that the H in phenol has a plus one oxidation state. And when it gets converted to elemental hydrogen, it's gonna be zero. And for sodium, this is sodium element, oxidation state is zero. When it becomes part of the salt, it goes up to plus one. So you can see that sodium is being oxidized and hydrogen is being reduced. So we have our redox. And uh, one observation for this reaction is that uh, hydrogen gas, when it comes out, you test for it using a lighted split. Uh, when you have a test tube full of hydrogen and you place a lighted splint inside, uh, the flame is going to go out and you're going to hear a nice little squeaky pop, right? Um, you know, I'm not sure if you've been to the lab or not, but it's one of the most satisfying sounds in the chemistry lab, at least for students of A-level. Anyway, now moving on to the reactions of the benzene ring, right? So... Phenol also undergoes substitution reactions with bromine and with nitric acid, right? So we're gonna look at bromine. Now it reacts with bromine water to produce a compound known as 246-tribromophenol, right? We also covered naming of uh, um, aromatic compounds in the previous episode, right? So over here, what we do is carbon atom number one in the benzene ring is the one bonded to the OH. And then you can count either clockwise or anti-clockwise. I'm going to go with clockwise. So this is going to be two, three, four, five, and six. So we have a bromine at number two, number four, and number six. So we have these three numbers. And then because there are three bromines, so we have tri-bromo. And then the base compound was phenol. That's what we started out with, right? So over here, we got... 246 tribromophenol and we get hydrogen bromide, right? So this 246 tribromophenol, this is a white precipitate. It's a white solid that appears uh, when you mix these two, um, phenol and aqueous bromine together, right? It's a white solid that appears that's insoluble in water. And the bromine water, which is actually orange, right? The bromine water, which is orange, is decolorized. 
it goes from orange to colorless. So that's another observation. You get a white solid or a white precipitate. You get um, orange bromine water being decolorized, right? And we get hydrogen bromide. And this hydrogen bromide can also be observed as white fumes. But the thing is that these white fumes dissolve very quickly in water, so it's not a very reliable observation as compared to the white precipitate and the bromine water being decolorized. Now, one thing that you need to remember is that OH, OH is an electron donating group, right? Or you could say that it is ring activating. What that means is that uh, in a benzene ring that contains an OH group, the further electrophilic substitution will take place at positions two, four, and six, right? And that happens because of the fact that the OH group um, donates the pair of electrons that it shares with the benzene ring. It pushes them towards the benzene ring. And so two, four, and six become activated for further substitution, um, as in this case with the bromine. Now, one thing that you uh, will notice over here is that I did not mention any catalyst, right? If it was a simple benzene, I would have required bromine and I would have required a halogen carrier like aluminum bromide or iron-3 bromide. But in the case of phenol, you don't need that. And the reason is that, uh, Again, it has to do with the electron donating part, right? The thing is that if I zoom in on this a little, if I draw this over here. Now the benzene ring itself already contains six pi electrons, right? Now, when the bond over here gets donated by the OH group to this benzene ring, now what happens is that you get uh, two part-time members as well to this um, pi bonding ring, all right? You get two part-time members in this club, and so you get eight pi electrons, right? And so when you have the same ring of the same size, but you have more pi electrons, it becomes more electron dense or electron rich. And so it will attract more electrophiles more easily. Remember an electrophile? is an electron deficient species looking for something that contains more electrons, right? And if I have a benzene ring that contains more electrons in the pi bonding ring, there's a greater chance an electrophile will come knocking. And that's what happens over here. That's why we don't need the catalyst. And another interesting thing is that we don't even need pure bromine in this case. You need pure bromine to react with benzene, but with phenol, you can do it with aqueous solution, right? So these are two ways in which we show that phenol is actually more reactive than benzene. And another way in which we can show this uh, greater reactivity is that when the phenol reacts with nitric acid, it can react with both dilute as well as concentrated nitric acid. But with benzene, it has to be concentrated. And one other thing is that with phenol, you do not need H2SO4 catalyst. With benzene, you do, right? Now, over here, what's happening is that uh, phenol can give you, um, you know, two isomeric nitrophenols, right? The NO2 over here can either bond to carbon atom number two or carbon atom number four. So it becomes either two nitrophenol or four nitrophenol. You could get either of these and they're both equally likely, right? When this is dilute, but when it becomes concentrated, all three positions, two, four, and six get occupied. By the way, I did not mention six nitrophenol over here because if I were to have a nitro group over here, I would not be counting clockwise then. I would be counting anti-clockwise to get a smaller number in the name. And this would be number two again. So two and six positions are equivalent when only one of them is occupied. 
all right? And so when you have concentrated nitric acid, all three positions will be occupied rather than just one of them, as we saw in the previous example, right? And we will get 246 trinitrophenol. All right. Now let's move on to carboxylic acids. Another thing is that you guys already know carboxylic acids are weak organic acids. However, they are stronger than phenol. They're stronger than phenol and water and ethanol, right? And the reason is you have a greater degree of dissociation. More molecules of a carboxylic acid like ethanoic acid over here will break down or dissociate and they will give you a higher concentration of H plus in solution. And so you will have a lower pH, greater acidity. Why is that? So we have two reasons, right? The first reason is that over here, the carbon atom in the carboxylic acid group has two electronegative oxygen atoms bonded to it, right? Now this first oxygen atom that is bonded over here it pulls the um, bond pairs with the carbon towards itself. And so this carbon gains a very high partial positive charge. Now to counteract this uh, charge becoming too high, we want some stability, we want this charge to go down a little. What happens is that this carbon pulls this bond pair towards itself with carbon and oxygen. And so this oxygen over here it wants to assert its electronegativity, right? I mean, when a bond pair with the carbon is being pulled away from itself, it's like, you know what? I need to show the world that I am actually electronegative. I'm not this uh, friendly guy who could just give up his electrons. So what happens then is this pair of electrons becomes pulled closer to the oxygen. And when this happens, when you have bonds where... Um, the bond pair is too close to one of the atoms and not close enough to the other, the bond becomes weak. And so this H bond over here, it becomes so weak that this H plus is like, you know what, this oxygen just doesn't look very interested. Better move on, right? And so this hydrogen gets dissociated and moves on. And this is basically, this whole story tells us that the OH bond is weak. And so the H plus is easier to remove. And the reason why is because of this pull of electrons away from the hydrogen, right? To make the bond more skewed and weaker and easier to break. The other reason is that uh, once you have this dissociation done, you guys have this ethanoate ion, right? And it looks something like this. We have CH3, C double bond O, C single bond O. And this oxygen carries a negative charge. Now the thing is that these, this carbon and oxygen have a double bond, so there's a pi bond present here, right? Now the thing is that the oxygen carries three lone pairs, one of them in a p orbital can overlap with this pi bond that already exists. And so as a result, when this overlap occurs, this negative charge no longer remains local to this oxygen atom. It can be spread out over the entire COO group, right? And so what happens is you get CH3, C double bond O, C single bond O. So what will happen is, that when a lone pair ends up forming a pi bond with the carbon, it shifts to in between the carbon and oxygen. And for this carbon to maintain its valency of four, uh, the pi bond between the carbon and oxygen that already exists is going to break and the other oxygen will gain that pair of electrons. And so you're going to get a new arrangement where the other oxygen gets the negative charge and this oxygen gets the double bond. And so these two forms over here mean that the negative charge is spread out over the COO group. And when it's more spread out, the negative charge density is less 
the negative charge density is less and so the H plus is not really that attracted to the ion and so it would rather not get back together, right? And so the H plus concentration stays high and so the pH stays low. So those are the reasons why carboxylic acids are more acidic than phenol, right? This was the whole explanation of what I just told. So I'll just move on from here. All right. Now, one thing that you need to notice that um, in carboxylic acids and phenol, right? Again, there is an overlap of a lone pair on the oxygen, which is negatively charged in the anion, right? It is overlapping with the rest of the molecule. And so the negative charge density goes down. In the phenol though, which forms the phenoxide ion, if I show this over here, this lone pair that overlaps with the benzene ring, this is a partial overlap. But when it comes to the carboxylic acid, the oxygen with the negative charge that has a lone pair in a p orbital, when it overlaps with the pi bond in the C double bond O, this is a complete overlap. And that sets the carboxylic acid apart from the phenol. That's why the carboxylic acid is more acidic because of this complete overlap that delocalizes the negative charge more from the negative oxygen atom. And so that is why it's not going to attract H plus back towards itself. H plus is going to be free to move and do whatever. And so the pH is going to be low, right? Now, if I were to play around with carboxylic acids more, um, I could increase the acidity, right? And the way I could do this is to look at the alkyl group bonded to the carboxylic acid group. Over here, I have a methyl group, right? This is electron donating. And when this is electron donating, what happens is that uh, um, on the CO2 negative, the carboxylate group, the negative charge density is going to go up. And so it'll attract more H plus. And so when there's less H plus in the solution, you're going to have a lower acidity, a higher pH, right? Now, if I were to replace one of the hydrogens over here with a chlorine, now this is an electronegative atom with drawing electrons towards itself, right? It pulls electrons towards itself. And so as a result, electrons are pulled away from the carboxylate ion. So the negative charge goes down. And so uh, the same story repeats, H plus concentration remains high, all right? And if I increase the number of chlorine atoms from one to two, and then from two to three, you're going to have a greater pull of electrons away from the carboxylate group, the COO negative or CO2 negative. And so as a result, when there's a greater pull of electrons away from that, carboxylate group is going to have a lower negative charge density, making it less attractive to the H plus. And so H plus is not going to come back together with the anion to make the carboxylic acid molecule. It's going to stay in the solution. When you have more H plus in solution, greater acidity, right? And the Ka values over here just prove my point. All right, now reactions of carboxylic acids, you looked at most of these in AS level, right? So I'm not gonna go over those again. The main reactions that we're gonna be looking at are the oxidation of carboxylic acids. Now, you have studied in AS level organic chemistry that carboxylic acids do not get further oxidized, right? You can oxidize a primary alcohol or an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, but you cannot go further than that. Well, there are two exceptions to this, right? And those two exceptions are methanoic acid and ethane dioic acid, right? Also known as oxalic acid. All right, and we're gonna look at these two in detail. Now, the thing is that 
methanoic acid is basically a hydrogen atom bonded to the carboxylic acid group. Now you can imagine that uh, we have a carboxylic acid group on one side and the C double bond O is shared with an aldehyde group on the other side. And so it's the aldehyde part that gets oxidized further. And when that happens, the molecule that you get is highly unstable. And so it's just gonna break down to give you carbon dioxide and water. And this methanoic acid can be oxidized using weak oxidizing agents like Tollens reagent, like Felix reagent. With Tollens reagent, you're gonna get a silver mirror. With Felix reagent, you'll get a red precipitate. And you can use stronger oxidizing agents like uh, potassium dichromate or potassium manganate seven, right? So these are the results with Tollens reagent over here when you add methanoic acid and you warm it up a little bit. And this is the result with Felix reagent when you add methanoic acid and again, warm it up a little bit. And you can get the same results with potassium dichromate six. Uh, this is gonna go from orange to green. And with potassium manganate seven, this is gonna be from purple to colorless. All right. And you will need to heat up the methanoic acid with the oxidizing agent, and you're gonna get your carbon dioxide and water. Now with ethane dioic acid or oxalic acid, this is basically just two carboxylic acid groups bonded to each other. So you have CO2H over here, CO2H over here, all right? So this ethane dioic acid cannot be oxidized by Tollens or Felix reagents. Uh, you can only oxidize it with KMnO4, and you will need strong heating, not just a gentle warming, but strong heating. Bunsen burner, full throttle, right? And so this is gonna give you carbon dioxide and water again. And uh, whenever you write oxidation equations, you write the oxygen atom in brackets to show this is coming from the oxidizing agent, right? And uh, you can have the ionic equation over here as well, right? So the manganate over here has manganese with a plus seven, and this goes down to manganese with a two plus charge. So the manganese is being reduced and the carbon over here is actually being oxidized. Over here it is plus four, and over here it is plus three. So it goes like this, all right? Now, I couldn't really find a reason as to why this happens, but um, one thing that uh, I came up with just to make it easier for me to remember these facts is that in uh, methanoic acid, the carbon has an oxidation state of plus two, right? You have the formula over here, HCOOH, and uh, you can easily calculate this if you keep this as X, and you keep the two hydrogens as plus one and plus one, and the two oxygens will be two into minus two. And you add up all of these to give you zero, X is going to be plus two, right? And in ethane dioic acid, if you do the same calculation, you're gonna get plus three. And in carbon dioxide, it's plus four. So you can see that there's a greater difference in oxidation state between the carbon in methanoic acid and the carbon in carbon dioxide. And so there's a greater driving force, there's a greater motivation, you could say, for the carbon in methanoic acid to be oxidized to CO2, right? And so it can just use a little push from a weak oxidizing agent and a little bit of warming, and it will be on its way. For ethane dioic acid, though, we have a plus three oxidation state. It's already pretty high, right? And ethane dioic acid is already good enough. It doesn't want to aspire to greatness, right? As they say, good is the enemy of great. So that's basically why it has a less driving force. And so it needs a bigger push. It needs a stronger oxidizing agent. And that's why ethane dioic acid will only be oxidized by KMnO4 or K2Cr2O7 and strong heating. All right, so enough about all these details. Let's finally get to the past paper questions. 
Right. So we have uh, one of the classic question, comparison of acidity of water, phenol and ethanol, right? So over here, we know that phenol is the most acidic, followed by water. And we have ethanol, which is the least acidic, right? And uh, the explanation I've already given to you guys, but I'm just going to summarize this over here that uh, the phenoxide ion in phenol has a lower negative charge density and the reason for this is due to partial overlap of an oxygen lone pair with the pi bonding ring of benzene. All right. And so when this happens, um, we will say that less H plus is attracted to phenoxide ions. I'm just going to write the formula C6H5O negative. And so we have higher concentration. You can write concentration in square brackets in solution. And then you could write the same story for ethanol, right? Um, but it's the opposite, right? So ethanol produces ethoxide ions. And it has a higher negative charge density. So the dashes are negative and the arrow just means so, right? So we have a negative charge density due to electron donating ethyl group bonded to the O negative. And so this results in more H plus attracted to the ethoxide and ethoxide is C2H5O, the negative charge. And so this results in less, lesser concentration of H plus in solution. So this was the summary of that whole explanation that I gave you earlier, all right? Okay, so over here we have two nitrophenol, right? And it says over here the nitration reaction of phenol to form two nitrophenol shows that phenol is more reactive than benzene, right? Describe the conditions used for the nitration of phenol, right? So the conditions are just simple room temperature, right? All right, and we need to explain how these conditions show that phenol is more reactive, right? So the explanation is that you're just using room temperature, right? Um, you're saying that no catalyst is needed. Unlike in the case of benzene, you need concentrated sulfuric acid. For phenol, you need no catalyst, right? So no catalyst is needed and no heating is required to nitrate phenol at the same rate. at the same rate as benzene with concentrated sulfuric acid catalyst and heating. 
So this is the explanation how the conditions show the condition of room temperature that uh, you know phenol can be nitrated without a catalyst and without heating, but benzene requires those two things. And so that shows how phenol is more reactive. Now, so just why phenol is more reactive than benzene, right? So we know that we have an electron donating OH group bonded to the benzene ring. Right? And what happens because of this electron donating group is that it increases its electron density. which attracts electrophiles more easily. And so electrophilic substitution occurs, right? Now over here, we have a question that, um, well, for the details, you'll have to go back to the previous episode. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how this works, just a brief summary. So you have phenol over here. We know that the electrophile is the NO2 plus, and what will happen is, is that uh, we will draw a curly arrow for the benzene to the NO2 plus, right? That shows that a pair of electrons is going to be um, transferred from the benzene ring, that's the electron dense part, to the electron deficient NO2 plus, right? And when this happens, you get an intermediate that looks like this. You have an OH. Now remember the product that we need is two nitrophenol, right? So the NO2 is going to be bonded to carbon atom number two over here. So we have NO2 and we have a hydrogen at the same time. And we have a positive charge that is spread out over the entire ring because of the delocalized pi bonding system and the carbon hydrogen over here. This bond is going to break by heterolytic fission uh, to stabilize the positive charge, to neutralize it, and the hydrogen will leave as an H+. Plus. So the H+, plus is the electrophile being substituted by the NO2+, plus, right? And over here, we don't need to draw the product. All right, now over here, we have uh, a particular compound, which is phenyl-2-hydroxybenzoate, right? Mouthful of a name. And over here, we need to look at the reactions with sodium, bromine, and NaOH, right? Now, over here, we have um, three functional groups, right? We have an ester linkage over here. We have the phenol group that's OH bonded to a benzene ring. And we have a simple benzene ring over here. Now, from amongst these three functional groups, the sodium metal will only react with the phenol group. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to draw this structure over here, copy and paste everything except for the phenol group. And then in the phenol group, I'm just going to write, instead of OH, it's going to be O and A. You could also write a negative charge over here and a positive charge over here that shows that this is actually an ionic compound. It is a salt. And this type of reaction, you've already seen, this is redox. Because sodium metal is oxidized to Na+, the hydrogen in the OH is reduced to H2 gas. Now with excess bromine aqueous, now over here, now this is something that we need to look at, okay? Now for the phenol group, we know that the excess bromine is going to substitute at positions two, four, and six. So we have position two over here, position four, and position six, well, that is already occupied by the ester linkage. So I'm going to skip that. So I have the ester linkage over here and the other benzene ring. 
And over here, this is going to be OH. And over here, I have BR at position two and a BR at position four. Now over here, notice that this is excess bromine in aqueous solution, right? In aqueous solution, um, only the phenol group is going to react with bromine. If we had a catalyst, we had pure bromine, this benzene ring over here may have reacted with the bromine as well, but it doesn't. So over here we have electrophilic substitution. It's important that you guys write the word electrophilic, right? That'll give you the proper mark for this one. Now with excess hot NOH over here. Now out of these three functional groups, two of these is, are going to react. One of them is the phenol, but one of them, the more important one is the ester group. This ester group over here, it will break down at the carbon oxygen single bond. And this is called hydrolysis, if you remember from AS level. And so what we're gonna do over here is that uh, we break up this carbon oxygen single bond. What we get over here is this guy over here, which bonds to a hydrogen from water, right? So we get phenol. And on the other side, we're gonna get the phenol group that was already present. It's the OH. And over here we have C double bond O. Now this is not going to bond to an H, like over here, this is going to bond to an OH. The H and OH come from the water that hydrolyze this compound, break it up, right? Break up by water means hydrolysis, right? Now the thing is that this is excess. Now these products can further react. So what I'm gonna do over here, so I'm going to erase the OHs because this is phenol, it will react with the NOH and that's going to give us ONA. The carboxylic acid will also react to give us a salt and this OH will also react to give us a salt. So I'm going to write, instead of OH, I'm going to write ONA, ONA, and surprise, surprise, NaO because it's the oxygen that's bonded to the benzene ring. So that's why I changed the orientation here. All right, now finally, over here we have another question. If I were to compare the acidities of two chloropropanoic acid, three chloropropanoic acid and propanoic acid. Now over here, notice that uh, in these two acids, you have a chlorine, right? Electronegative atom in the alkyl group, and that is electron withdrawing. And so it's going to increase the acidity, but the two and the three do not mean that you have two or three chlorine atoms, but it's the position of that one and only chlorine atom. Now, how does that play a role? So the thing is that the closer the chlorine atom is to the uh, carboxylate ion, the more acidic it becomes. So two chloropropanoic acid is more acidic than three chloropropanoic acid. Which is mo more acidic than just plain old propanoic acid. Now for the interest of time, I'm not going to write down the entire explanation. I'm just going to draw it in the form of a diagram. Over here I have CH3CHCl. CO2 negative, right? So over here, I have this electronegative chlorine atom that pulls electrons away from the CO2 negative. And because it's closer, it has a stronger withdrawing effect. And so the negative charge density goes down. And so the concentration of H plus in the solution will remain high because the H plus will not be attracted to um, such a less negatively dense ion, right? And if I were to push this away to three chloropropanoic acid over here, this guy will pull electrons away from CO2 negative, but 
its electron density is not going to go down by much because the chloride is too far away to have much of an effect. And so the negative charge density will remain kind of intact. And so the concentration of H plus will be a little less in the solution because more H plus will be attracted to this anion to reform the molecules. And so the pH will be higher because the concentration of H plus is lower. And propanoic acid obviously does not even come into play because it does not even have those highly electronegative chlorine atoms in the alkyl group bonded to the carboxylate ion. All right, and over here, we look at the oxidation of the methanoic and ethane dioic acids. Right, so over here it says, that we need to complete this table with reagents and conditions that give us an observation with one or more of these acids. Now, the thing is that methanoic acid gives a positive result, whereas the other two do not. Now, they're all carboxylic acids. Now, what sets apart methanoic and ethane dioic acid are the fact that they can both be oxidized. A methanoic acid can be oxidized more easily using a weaker oxidizing agent like Tollens reagent. So I could write Tollens reagent plus one. And the observed change will be a silver mirror. All right. Now for test number two, the only acid that gives us um, an expected result is this guy over here, okay? Now the thing is that apart from the carboxylic acid group, it also has the C double bond O. Now this over here is a carbonyl group. And if you remember from AS level, you test for carbonyl group using 2,4-D and pH. 2,4 dinitrophenyl hydrazine, and this is going to give you an orange precipitate. All right, and for number three, you have methanoic and ethane dioic acids reacting, but the acid in the middle does not react. And so that means both of them are being oxidized and both of them are reacting with a strong oxidizing agent. And I could write over here, um, acidified KMnO4 plus heat. All right, and that's going to give us uh, the change from purple, that's the color of KMnO4, to colorless, that's the color of the Mn2+, plus, if you remember from the equation I gave you earlier, when ethane dioic acid reacts with the manganate 7 ions. All right, so that was a pretty lengthy session on phenol and carboxylic acids, but uh, we have wrapped up two pretty important topics in uh, A2 organic chemistry. All right. So if you have any questions, do leave them in the comments. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fahad. And thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in another video.